In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, so that we might worthily more celebrate, celebrate these sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you almighty God and Prince of Peace, Lord have mercy. Christ Jesus, you are Son of God and Son of Mary, Christ have mercy. Lord Jesus, you plead for us at the right hand of the Father, Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, may he forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, who reward the merits of the just, and offer pardon to sinners who do penance. Have mercy, we pray, on those who call upon you, that the admission of our guilt may serve to obtain your pardon for our sins. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I answer you. On the day of salvation, I help you. And I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to restore the land and allot the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out. To those in darkness, show yourselves. Along the ways they shall find pasture, on every bare height shall their pastures be. They shall not hunger or thirst, nor shall the scorching wind or the sun strike them. For he who pities them leads them and guides them and leads them beside springs of water. I will cut a road through all my mountains and make my highways level. See, some shall come from afar, others from the north and the west, and some from the land of Serene. Sing out, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Bring forth into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and shows mercy to his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget her infant, be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even should she forget, I will never forget. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus answered the Jews, My father is at work until now, so I am at work. For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. But he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son of Man cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For what he does, the Son will do also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, so that you may be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also does the Son give life to whomever he wishes. Nor does the Father judge anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but has passed from death to life. Amen, amen, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he gave to the Son the possession of life in himself. And he gave him power to exercise judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this because the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good deeds to the resurrection of life but those who have done wicked deeds to the resurrection of condemnation. I cannot do anything on my own. I judge as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening and welcome to the third and final night of our Lenten mission. Um, just in case someone is just popping in for the first night, uh, I'll give you a little synopsis of what's been happening. Uh, we're looking ahead at uh, Holy Week and the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, the Easter Vigil. And over the last couple of nights, I've been going through the readings I don't think they always get preached on during those celebrations because there's so much other stuff that's happening. So we're looking at the readings that they might not be overlooked and uh, at the rituals as well so that when we enter into them in a couple of weeks, we'll have a greater celebration of, uh, of the, the, vig the vigil and the ritual. So for the Easter Vigil, if I could give you uh, the roots of the Easter Vigil, it started in the very early church. And what would happen is uh, the people would come into church around sunset and they would stay in the church all night until the rising of the sun the next morning. They would read the scriptures, they would pray, they would sing. And so they had a full night of a vigil waiting for Christ in the morning and the, and the rising sun. Well, years ago, that all night vigil got cut back to seven readings from the Old Testament, and then an epistle and a gospel from the New Testament, and then a homily in the, uh, the baptism of all the elect who were there, the ones who had been training for uh, baptism, getting ready to understand what was going on in the church, they would be brought in after the gospel and they would be baptized. So what we have now is a very shortened Easter Vigil. When I was a young man in seminary, uh, we always read all seven of the first readings for the Old Testament. If you shop around now, 
you'll probably find a few parishes that still do it, all seven of the readings and then the uh, epistle of gospel. But many churches, uh, they opt for three of the Old Testament readings, uh, especially if they get big classes of those being uh, baptized or those being confirmed, and there's going to be a lot of ceremony, they cut it down to three readings. And even if they do use all seven readings, they don't usually preach upon all of them. And so what I, I'm going to do tonight, I have the opportunity to say a word or two about all seven of the readings so that we can grasp and understand the intention of the church with those readings. So here we begin. We start outside with the lighting of a fire. The Easter candle, the Paschal candle, is lit from the fire. And then the candle comes down the aisle, and we hear the, the phrase, Christ our light, and we sing thanks be to God. It stops three times. And each time, people take their candles and get it lit from the Easter candle and pass it through the pews. So by the time the candle gets to the altar, the church is ablaze with Easter light, all those candles. Then we have what's called the Easter Proclamation, or the Exultet in Latin. The priest or the deacon stands before the candle, blesses it, and then sings a song. The Exultet is such a beautiful part of the Easter Vigil. In the middle of it, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, I always wait for, listen for, one of my favorite phrases. It says in the middle of the exultat, O Felix culpa, it's Latin for, O happy fault. What are they talking about? And the exultat was saying, the sin of Adam and Eve way back when. You know what it did? It necessitated for us a savior. And the savior Jesus has come to us, and we're gonna hear what it says as you listen to the exultant. Oh, happy fault that warranted for us so great, so glorious a redeemer. Stop and think about that. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, life would have been different. But Jesus would never have come into the world. When Jesus came into the world, he didn't only overturn the sins of Adam and Eve. He certainly did that. But he also incorporated us into the family of Christ. We became adopted children of God the Father. This was all as a result of Christ coming into the world. And that's why in the middle of the exultet, you hear that, oh, happy fault, oh, Felix Culpa. Watch for it at the vigil. Then we start the readings. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, the first chapter, the first verse. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland. It goes on to the second chapter, verse 2, and it closes. And that all follows for that opening line. The earth was a formless wasteland. And so in the first reading, you sit there and listen to God's act of creation on the six days, what he did each day. It's a beautiful reading from the Old Testament. Then we move to the second reading. The second reading is still in the book of Genesis, but it's much later on. We start with chapter 22, verses 1 to 18. Just to quote, not the whole thing. God put Abraham to the test. You know exactly the story. Abraham takes Isaac up on the hill, puts some logs together, ties him up, and is about to slay him. Remember, 
Abraham and Sarah were old and childless. And they were visited by God who told them that they would have a great nation descended from them. And because they didn't distrust God, because they believed what he said, nine months later they had a child, an only child, Isaac. Their promise of many descendants, descendants countless as the stars in the sky or the sands of the beach, it all hinges upon Isaac. And now God the Father is telling Isaac, slay him. And after Isaac is placed on the wood and Abraham is about to slay him, God stays the hand of Abraham. And Isaac is not slain. It was a test of faith. Now, if any of you during this COVID period think you hear God telling you to kill the kids, don't do it. <laughs> Abraham had such a relationship with God that he recognized the voice of God. And you had to have the amount of faith that Abraham had in God to go through with it at all. So we know Abraham's faith was incredible. Ours may not be quite so firm. So don't, don't kill the kids. We move on to the third reading. This is from Exodus. Now we jump a bit. It begins with chapter 15. And it says this. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward, and you lift up your staff, and with hands stretched out over the sea, split the sea in two. Of course, when we hear those lines, it brings us back to the history of salvation. We know what's happened with the Israelites in captivity in Egypt. And we know that now they're being led to freedom uh, by Moses. Moses needs help. And he cries out to God. And God said, just do as I say. Tell them to go on. Tell them to go forward. And they do. And they make it through the sea. That's the uh, third reading. Now we move to the fourth reading. This is from Isaiah. So we jump bit further down in the Old Testament. It's not the opening line, um, but remember as you hear it, it is God who is speaking, and this is how it goes. For a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with great tenderness, I will take you back. This is the story of the Israelites Leaving, coming back, leaving, coming back, all the time, always falling away. Um, what we heard in this reading is what we call an anthropomorphism. You may have heard me use that term before. Anthropomorphism, well, you know what anthropology is the study of man. So anthropomorphism, you know what to morph something means to change. So anthropomorphism means to take God and to kind of change him into a human being by thrusting upon him human attributes. There are certain things that God would never do. But the Israelites know that they can do it among themselves. They do it all the time. They abandon one another. God would never abandon his people. So why does it say here in the scripture, for a time I abandoned you, because it was the, the Israelites who are writing down these things. They're the author, and they thrust their own personality upon God. So there are a few places in the scriptures you need to be careful, like, God wouldn't do that. If you think God wouldn't do that, it's probably an anthropomorphism. The writer of the scriptures setting up upon God a human attribute. But it, it has meaning. Because in fact, that's the way the Israelites felt. They felt abandoned by God. But as we read on, 
you're going to see that it's always the people's fault. It's not God's fault. So we go to the fifth reading. Thus says the Lord, all you who are thirsty, come to the water. And then a few verses later, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call him while he is near. Once again, he's reaching out to his people who have strayed and he's making them an offer. Don't stay in that parched land. Don't stay in captivity. Come to the water here back in your homeland, Israel, and cry out to me while I'm near, while I can hear you. He's giving them another chance. We hear it over and over. Then we go to the, the sixth reading of the Old Testament, and this is from the book of the prophet Baruch. We don't use readings from Baruch much in church, so this is one that you may not have heard. It's God speaking through the prophet. How is it, Israel, that you are in the hands of your foes, grown old in a foreign land? You have forsaken the fountain of wisdom. Had you walked in the way of God, you would have dwelt in enduring peace. Remember one night I talked a little bit about the Babylonian captivity. The people were going off into slavery and King Cyrus allowed them to go back. He's speaking to them at the end of that Babylonian captivity. Why am I seeing you, my people, in foreign lands, in the hands of your foes? It's because you abandoned the fountain of wisdom. You did stupid things. And you, you brought down your defenses and you were easily overrun and taken into captivity. If you had followed God's ways by listening to the wisdom that was preached to you by the prophets, you would have dwelt in enduring peace. And then the final Old Testament reading for the vigil, the seventh one is from the book of Ezekiel, another prophet, God speaking through the prophet. I will gather you from all the foreign lands and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new, a new heart and place within you a new spirit. So that's how we are left at the end of the seven readings for the Old Testament. You can feel the, uh, the excitement building to the point where God says, I'm going to give you a new heart and place a new a spirit within you. We are being set up for what's about to come. I'm going to sprinkle you with water and cleanse you. It's a fever pitch. Boom. And then there's a, a rather dramatic difference that takes place. In the early church, The lights of the church were lit, and the people went from the Old Testament to the New Testament. All the congregants would stand when the lights came on and the bells were ringing, and they would turn to the west, where the night was receding with all of its darkness and all of its sin and they would bid farewell to the darkness and to sin. And then they would turn to the east, where the faint rays of sunlight were beginning to illuminate the windows, making the interior of the church also begin to glow with the morning light. Having greeted this new light, 
the Gloria will be joyfully sung. And then the New Testament epistle would be proclaimed. Here we have a lighting system. There's so many switches back there that for these individual, you start to see boom, 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 boom. A set of lights go out here and there all over. It takes a, a minute to get them all up and going. In seminary, there were switches, but they're all in a line. If you go one, two, three, four, five, that wasn't fast enough for us. So we came up with the idea of taking a wooden ruler and putting it under the switches and throwing it up. And all of a sudden, boom, all the lights in the church would come on bright. I'm surprised we never crashed the electric grid. So much power came in at once. And the Gloria was being sung because the bells were being rung. We used to invite our parents to come down and celebrate the vigil with us. And I remember one year, I knew it was coming. The lights were going to come on, the bells were going to ring. I was watching my dad in the pews because I knew after seven long readings of the dark, he'd be out cold. And, and he was. And the lights came out of the bells. He jumped. I'm lucky he's still with us. They didn't have a heart attack. It was so dramatic. Because it is dramatic. The shift between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So now we're back to a reading. The first reading is the epistle uh, to the Romans. Uh, I'm only going to quote uh, a portion of it. Brothers and sisters, are you unaware that we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. That's a perfect hinge pen between what the Old Testament was trying to prepare us for and what's about to be proclaimed in the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus. It was a, a good catechetical resource in the early church because it tells those who are the elect, those are the people coming into baptism, it told them, this is what's going to happen. You're going to come up here. You're going to go under the water. It symbolizes your death to an old way of life, to sin. You're going to come up out of the water, and it symbolizes your resurrection with Christ. No one ever said it better than St. Paul. Then we have the gospel. The gospel is taken from the gospel of St. Mark. Just one quote from it. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. So now you know where you are, you're at the tomb. The scriptures make a big point of saying that they rolled a heavy stone across the tomb. Now the women are going out to anoint him, and they probably have in their minds this uh, anxiety about how are we ever going to move that stone? But when they get there, their anxiety drops because the stone's already been moved for them. And they go in, and they see an angel, a man, it says, sitting there in white robes on the place where the body of Jesus had been laid. And they look around, and he says, he's not here. Look around for yourselves. They look around the tomb. Jesus is not there. And he tells the women, go and tell the disciples what you've seen, and tell them that the Lord is going to meet them in Galilee. That's kind of interesting. Not the disciples who come to the tomb, first it's the women, and they are sent 
to bring the good news to the apostles. So we call those women the apostles to the apostles. They brought the good news to the apostles. So why did Jesus do it that way? Well, Mark wanted us to understand where did Jesus' public ministry begin? It began in Galilee. So his time on earth in human flesh was uh, three, some three years beginning at Galilee, and then he spread. But it only spread so far before his death. He wanted the disciples to go to Galilee. He didn't want them coming to him. He wanted to go to them at Galilee so that from the place where he began his own public ministry, he could now send them out to bring that limited ministry while he was here in the flesh to let it become a ministry that would go out to all the world. And so that's why he called the uh, apostles, the disciples, uh, to Galilee. Then preparations after the gospel, they made for the baptism of the elect. The baptismal promises are renewed by the whole congregation. I remember once uh, reading a quote from uh, Paul VI. He once preached, if you do not believe in the devil, extinguish your candles. Because we're all standing there with our candles lit and we're going to renew our baptismal promises. And we're asked, do you reject Satan and all his evil works? And we have to say, yes, I reject Satan. The Pope had caught on that a lot of people in modern society, they don't really believe in the devil. They think it's just a made-up story. The church made it up to, to get us to, to fear him and to do the right thing. But Paul was saying, don't make that mistake. The devil's best tool is to convince you that he doesn't exist. Then you'll never have your, your guard up against him. So Paul said, he's there. Evil's personified. How would he know? Well, all those bishops and archbishops who had appointed within their diocese a holy priest uh, to be the one who would cast Satan out. Each diocese had one priest. We all have the powers to cast out evil demons. We're all ordained as exorcists, but only one priest is allowed to use the power in a diocese. And word goes up to their bishops and cardinals to the Pope, and he would be aware of how often around the world we found it necessary to perform an exorcism. So he knew from their stories, these priests and bishops, how real the devil was, and he doesn't want us to forget it. So at the Easter Vigil, when you're rejecting Satan with your candle in your hand, go inside and use it as a moment to put up your shields against him. Because if we ever needed it, we need it now. Um, the baptism here takes place in a, in a font pouring water. I remember one year I was fortunate enough to be assigned to an Air Force base as the chaplain where they had a beautiful fountain right outside the front doors of the chapel. So as would have happened in, in the early church, you see in Europe there's a basilica and right next door there's a building that looks an awful lot like it but a lot smaller. That's the baptistry because those people who were going through the process of conversion, they weren't allowed in the church until they'd been baptized. So it was a separate building. When I found a, a fountain outside of the chapel, I said, we're going to do the same. So uh, all of the uh, catechumens, the elect, uh, during the epistle of the gospel, they left the church. Uh, they get dressed in white robes and they came outside. The water was carried out that had been blessed and we uh, poured the water over their heads in the fountain. Uh, 
old people were standing around. They'd all come out of the church, and they all told me, Father, this is the most beautiful baptism we've ever seen. It's the way it was in the early church. But we have our baptisms. They take place. And then the Mass continues as ordinary, but with the newly baptized people present for the first time. I want to leave you with just a couple of questions as we get ready for Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil. Number one, as I listen to salvation history lived out in the story of the Israelites, do I hear my own story wandering away, being brought back, getting cold, being brought back? Number two, am I grateful for God's unceasing mercy in my life? How grateful am I, how thankful am I for all those opportunities to come back? We celebrated it the last three nights beautifully in the confessional. God's mercy, every time you slip and fall back, you come to confession and get his mercy. Are we grateful for the sacrament of reconciliation and do we use it enough? Number three, am I grateful for the chance to renew my baptismal promises? Don't let it be an empty act at the Easter Vigil when you renew those promises and you declare your, your, your confession of faith. I believe when you say it, thank God that you have the chance to renew your baptism. And the last one, am I eager for the chance to start again? Let me leave you with this thought. What I like to do on Friday after the service, after the, uh, the veneration of the cross, or if the parish has it later on in the day after the station of the cross, when Jesus is... Uh, not present in the church. Stop and think for just a minute. He's in the tomb. And he'll be there until we celebrate his resurrection uh, late on Saturday night. Does it make a difference in your life if Jesus is not present to you? What would your life be like without Jesus? We ask people for some solemn reflection on Good Friday and Holy Saturday as they ponder that thought. Let's be grateful for the opportunity every year to start again. And let's hopefully this year enter into the Triduum with greater understanding and therefore have greater celebrations. God bless.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. <clears throat> May the power of this sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, mercifully wipe away what is old in us and increase in us the grace of salvation and newness of life through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you have given your children a sacred time for the renewing and purifying of their hearts, that freed from disordered affections, they may so deal with the things of this passing world as to hold rather to the things that eternally endure. And so with angels and saints, we praise you as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. <clears throat> In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this in memory of me. <clears throat> the mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with our Holy Father, Pope Francis, with Thomas, our bishop, with Robert, his assistant bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, 
with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, with St. Patrick, the patron of Ireland, whose feast we celebrate today, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, that we too may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. <clears throat> At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, <clears throat> as we forgive those who trespass against us. <clears throat> Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body of Christ give you sake for eternal life.
Let us pray. May your heavenly gifts, O Lord, we pray, which you bestow as a heavenly remedy on your people, not bring judgment to those who receive them through Christ our Lord. Before the final blessing, I would like to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day, or what's left of it. St. Patrick, as you know, is the patron of Ireland and a great saint of the church, great missionary saint of the church. So we pray tonight through his intercession. And last but not least, I want to thank Father Mungin for his wonderful reflections these past three evenings. Thank you, Father. The Lord be with you. Bow your heads for the blessing. May your servants be shielded, O Lord, by the protection of your loving kindness. And doing what is good in this world, they may reach you their highest good through Christ our Lord. May the blessing of Almighty God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thank you.